hear that rock and roll music? Mm -hmm. Ready? And just look at him. Yes. You're just looking at him. <laughs> Who's my best friend? Why do you think we need friends? Just one at a time. <laughs> Why did I... Are you my best friend? I don't think I can say that, dude. What do you call our friendship? <laughs> Ebony and Ivory. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> You're really good. Why do you think it's important for people to have good friends? I think everyone needs someone to connect with. Why, is it, why do you think it's hard for guys to have friends these days, maybe? I think man night might have been the best event we've ever done. He didn't say anything. There's no way. There's no way. She ufero iresi jollof rice. I don't know. Who do you think leads the volunteer rally? And Shawnee, the best. <laughs> uh, I don't, like... Who? Who? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you love most about me? What do I love most? Oh You're reading the marriage question, not the friends question. I think you got confused. Are you my friend? I don't know, bro. Do friends hold hands? Say it again. Do friends hold hands? If you were going to pass through a different campus, which campus do you think you might pass through the Cadena Church? <laughs> I have no idea. Will you go to Africa with me? I will go with you. To where? But not yet. <laughs> That's our favorite movie, Gladiator, uh, and so we quote it to each other. Oh, my God. Welcome to VFC. It's a great church with a really dumb staff. So happy to have you here today. Uh, just kidding, they're all amazing and brilliant, and I love them. Uh, those of you watching online, hey, grateful for you, love you. Uh, thanks for watching wherever you are watching from. Hey, a couple things real quick. Uh, one, maybe you saw some superheroes outside today. Um, this is, we just started what we call best month ever for our, our kids' ministry. So every single week this this whole month will be something different so uh you kids are gonna love coming to kids church they, they, they love it every week but they're gonna love it even more uh have a lot of fun stuff uh this this entire month and then uh next sunday is friends day okay so it's a little bit trickier talking about friends day to the 10 o'clock crowd because i'm not sure how to tell you to bring your friends because there's no space for your friends so here's what i want to challenge you to do bring a friend to a different service next sunday so that's what but you attend with them uh statistics say i think it's like 84 percent of people have said unchurched people said they would uh, attend church if someone invited them and actually brought them and so i want to encourage you uh don't just invite somebody but bring somebody with you uh next week not somebody that attends another church that's not the point of this it's not trying to do that but somebody that doesn't have a home church i want to encourage you uh invite them and bring them with you uh to the 8 30 9 15 10 45 11 30 or 1 o'clock service next next week um so we're starting a sermon series on on, on relationships and i think it's going to be really fun next next month uh, i think one of one of my problems in in pretty much all relationships and really even in front of the church christy gets irritated a lot she thinks i overshare a lot um and and that's, that's, that's probably true. I, if, like if we go to dinner with somebody, uh, like for the first time, I'll, I'll tell them I have a prostate problem within like three minutes. <laughs> it's, a, it's more of a self-preservation move because I know, I know I'm going to have to get up from the table 14 times to go pee. So I'd rather just tell them on the front end, like I got a medical issue. I'm not trying to get up and like check Instagram or anything. I don't even have that, but check, you know, like I'm just like, I get issues. So she gets mad that I overshare. Uh, a few years ago, I told you guys that when her feet get sweaty, they smell like nacho cheese Doritos. She thought that was too much. Um, but like, who doesn't like nacho cheese Doritos? Like, I didn't say cool. If it was cool ranch, then that, would, that wouldn't be cool. But nacho cheese, like, it's, I like nacho cheese Doritos. The feet can smell a lot worse. She thinks I, 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 I overshare about about the, the kids quite a bit, which is probably true. They confirm that some days when they, 
when they get home. So I, I overshare a little bit. Uh, you know, you know who else in scripture overshared a bit too much? Joseph. That guy. We've talked about Joseph a lot over the years, and I'm going to do a, uh, a massive disservice to this incredible, incredible story, but because I preach it so much, I'm just going to go super fast, uh, and then we're going to really focus more on his brothers than on, on him today. You, you, in the past, we don't preach it, really just talk about him, but we're going to talk about his relationship with his, with, his, with, with his brothers today. So Joseph, you guys remember Joseph, Coat of Many Colors guy? Right, he is he is eleven of twelve in 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 the in, in the line of of his of his father's kids. So his father's twelve kids. He is eleven of twelve, but he's daddy's favorite, right? And and so he got the he got the coat, and then all of a sudden God begins giving him dreams, and he overshares, he overshares. So he tells his brothers his dreams. They get mad, and then he has another dream. Should have learned the first time. He overshares, tells his brothers his dream. His brothers get even more mad. They beat him up. They throw him in a pit, sell him into slavery, tell his dad that he is, he is dead. And they said, uh, pack of animals got him, ate him. He is, he is dead. And so, so now he's sold into slavery. He's, he's a slave. He's actually doing really well. There's a guy named Potiphar that he's, uh, a, a, that he's a slave for. Potiphar's wife wants to have some extracurricular activities with Joe. Joe says, no thanks. Potiphar's wife falsely accuses Joseph. Now Joseph goes to prison for something that he did not do. In prison, Joseph uh, interprets dreams of the, of the king. He finally gets out of prison and then, and then works his way up to where he's second in charge of the entire country. There's a, a, a massive famine in the land. And then uh, guess who comes and needs a little bit of food? The brothers. And Joseph's in charge of distributing the food, and long story short, they reconcile. Again, that is a massive disservice to this story, but we're going to look at how these relationships can become so incredibly unhealthy. So again, we've talked about Joseph uh, so, several times. We don't talk about his family a lot, but they were like highly, highly dysfunctional. I don't want to have you raise your hand if you come from dysfunction. Some of you are like, I put the fun and dysfunctional in my family. Like, you're dysfunctional. So Jacob, he had, and you, you, you got, those of you that think you're from a, a dysfunctional spot, like, Joseph, dad had Jacob, right? He had, he had two wives and two concubines. Now that was, that was more common back then, but it's still a really, really bad idea that's going to end in absolute disaster every single time. So Dad's got a couple of wives, a couple of concubines. His, his, his dad had been deceitful. His dad had been deceived. So there's been a tremendous amount of dysfunction that, that Joseph has and his brothers have grown up in. Pete Shazero, he says this. He said, Jesus may live in our heart, but Grandpa lives in our bones. What he's saying is we're a product of our environment. And oftentimes we're a product of our relationship. You, you, everybody's heard this. It's an old saying and it's always true. You guys finish this sentence. Show me your friends and I'll show you your. Not everybody. Oh, I said everybody knows that. Four people knew that. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. All of us, I, I believe, want to have healthy relationships. And today, uh, next week we're going to talk about how to have healthy relationships. But today we're going to talk about three relationship killers that affected Joseph's family and possibly is affecting your relationships or maybe lack thereof. Some of you, now listen, this is going to sound super mean and it's intended to. Some of you, you wonder why it's hard for you to keep friends. It's because you often participate in one of these three relationship killers. Oftentimes, don't get offended, oftentimes the reason why you don't have friends, it, 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 it's your fault. Now, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not, okay? I'm going to leave that out for some of you that, you know, you have, you know, other things. But most of the time, we don't have good relationships because... Because we are participating in these relationship killers. The first killer is the killer of offense. So we know this. Joseph was his daddy's favorite. He got treated better. He got these gifts. He got the coat. And his brothers hated him. Genesis chapter 37 verse 4 says, When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. 
jump to verse 8. It says, his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. They cannot believe that this guy Joseph would have the audacity to claim that he will in any way ever rule over them. They're all older than than Joseph. And and culturally, I, I think... That matters a little bit in, in, in our society, but not really at all. But in this society, birth order mattered a lot. They're offended that Joseph thinks that he's ever going to have the right to be able, be able to rule over them. And uh, I do believe this. I believe that we have a society that gets offended way too easy, and we feed into that way too much. But usually the tough guys that gripe about society being soft and everybody getting so offended, usually those are the dudes that are the most offended about everything else in life. You ever notice that? Like people are like, everybody's so soft, everybody get offended so easy. Like usually they're the ones that are getting offended about everything, right? I hate it, I hear this all the time. Not all the time, I hear it a lot. No offense, but, you guys hear that? <sighs> it's always offensive, always. So I asked our staff this week, this is terrible, I asked our staff this week, I said, just, just tell me a few things that have been said to you by church folks, right? So this is, this is, this is church. This is things that you, you guys have said to our staff. <laughs> You're laughing now. That's not funny. No offense, but you'd be so much prettier if you lost some weight. I told you. No offense, but I thought you were a white person when I was talking to you on the phone. No offense, but I'm not going to be able to remember how to say your name. We have a, a guy on staff, he, he's lost, him and his wife both lost a lot of weight. He's lost like 130 pounds, and I'm super, super proud of him. Uh, when his wife had a, had a baby years ago, uh, somebody said, how did something that small come from you two? No offense, though, right? I mean, it's not, uh, how about this one? Uh, someone that ad- ad- adopted on our staff. No offense, but could you not have kids on your own? You got real quiet. It's like real quiet in here. So oftentimes, we say everybody's too soft, but oftentimes, we're, we're just kind of jerks to people. Uh, oftentimes, man, we are pretty offensive, but, but, but even if somebody is highly offensive to you, here's my encouragement today, don't take the bait. John Bevere wrote a book called The Bait of Satan. I don't know if you've ever read it, but I would encourage every single person in this room to read the book, The Bait of Satan. And he talks about the great bait of Satan to hook you, to, to, to drag you in, is the bait of offense. Like, I love, I shouldn't say I love the fish, because that's not necessarily true. I love to catch fish. How many, how many of you... How many of you are like me? You don't want to sit there for five hours and not catch anything? Like, some people love that. Some people love that. I'm just like, chilling, it's fine, you know, it's cool. That's not me. How many of you only want to actually catch something? You're only going to go if you can be guaranteed something. That's me. That's, yeah. All right. If you guarantee me I'm going to catch some fish, I am in. I'm going to have a blast. But if you, like, don't, I'm never going to go to a lake, like a big lake to fish. I, I want to go to a very stocked pond. That's what I want to go. That's what I like, right? You get your, you get your, you know, tackle, or lure, you know, throw it out there. And, man, I love it. There's nothing like having an 18-pound bass on the line. That's usually what I catch. 18-pound is usually. <laughs> but when I have my 18-ounce bass on the line, <laughs> I, just got, I just got a little bit wrong there. Um, once you get at the thing, it's hooked. You're fully in control. I take that wherever I want to reel it in. You got that... Got that hook deep in that lip. Now this is this is what the enemy does with with offense. Throw that coworker backbiting you, a spouse yelling at you, uh, someone reminds you of your past to disqualify you of your future, a, a political Facebook post that gets you, another parent saying something about your kid. It's tough. That's tough. 
this dangling offense right, right in front of you. I'm, I'm not saying you can't respond. I'm not saying you can't challenge or, 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 or correct. What I'm saying is don't ever latch on to the bait of offense because once you latch on to the bait of offense, the enemy begins dragging you around. If the enemy can hook you, then he can begin to control you because offense unchecked in your heart turns to bitterness and bitterness quickly, quickly erodes your soul. Joseph had every chance in the world to be offended, but he didn't take the bait. He avoided offense. Why? Because he knew God was in control. He, he knew, I'm not going to be offended because I, I know my brothers aren't in control of the situation. Potiphar is not in control of the situation. The king is not in control of the situation. My dad is not in control of this situation. I know that my God is in control. And when things don't make sense, when my circumstances seem to be much different from how I thought this was going to play out, it's okay because I know my God is in control. I think the hardest part about a leadership oftentimes is biting your tongue when people are saying stupid stuff about you. There have been, there have been times over the years where I've, people have been saying stuff, and I'll tell Chris, I'm like, I just want to send the whole church an email and say, oh, y'all want to know the truth? Yeah, listen to this. Right? But I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I just have to understand God's in control. God's in control. My life is his. My future is his. My reputation is his. My family, his. This church is his. Everything. I just got to stay locked into Jesus and let him take care of everything else. Because here, here's the thing. You cannot walk in joy and offense at the same time. They can't, they, they can't coexist. In, in Nehemiah chapter 8, it says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What does that also mean? When you lose your joy, you lose your strength. If you're walking around offended, then you're not going to walk around in joy. You're going to lose the, the strength of God in your life. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, an offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city. What does that mean? It means if you offend somebody, then you have lost the ability to influence them. We have to be... We have to work hard to not be offensive. We also have to work even harder to not take offense. And here's the problem with a lot of folks. They say, I'm just being me. That's just like, you know what my Myers-Briggs is. You know what my, I'm an Enneagram 8. That's just me. I'm a, I'm a this, I'm a this, I'm a this. I'm just being me. I'm just, that's just who I am. I'm just telling the truth. Stop trying to be you. Where in the Bible does it say that? In fact, it says die to your flesh daily. Like anything you think, oh, this is just who I am, maybe you should consider dying to that. There's this whole like, I don't know, I don't know what it's called. It's like popular now. Find your authentic self. That's stupid. Die to your authentic self. My authentic self is trash. I know my authentic self. Trash. I got to die to that. You know what I want, I, want, I want? My goal is not to be a better version of me. My goal is to look just like Jesus. I don't need to, you, you, some of you be like, well, that's, just, that, that's just how God created me. No, no, it's not. God did not create you to be offensive. That's, that's, that's not it. We got to guard our hearts and our tongues at the same time. Offense is a relationship killer. Second killer is jealousy. Joseph has another dream, shares again. Dude, got to stop it with the sharing. His father rebukes him. His brothers are jealous. Not only is he daddy's favorite, but now God's given him the, the dreams, and it seems he's headed towards a better life that they wanted. Genesis 37, 10. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Healthy relationships and jealousy also don't go together. Well, because if you're, if you're jealous of somebody else, you cannot celebrate other people's success. And listen, if you can't celebrate other people's success, you're going to quickly find out they don't actually want to be around you. 
And if you're jealous of them, you know what? You're, you're always going to be the one-upper. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be helpful. If you are a one-upper, nobody likes you. Again, I'm, my name is Adam. I'm your pastor, and I'm here to help you. Like, somebody comes to you, and they're excited. They just got a new job, and they tell you, and if your response is, oh, well, I just bought a company. They don't like you. Nobody likes you. <laughs> somebody has a kid that's been struggling in school, and they're so excited to share. They got an A in their class. You're like, oh, that's great. My kid just got into Harvard. Nobody likes you. And I'm trying to help you. I want people to like you. If you're jealous, you're always trying to measure up to somebody else. Wishing that you had their life, not yours. Jealousy is something else that erodes your soul. You notice all this, it just erodes your soul. Destroys your relationships. Sometimes my, my kids, they, they think things aren't very fair. My daughter would be like, why do I got to go to bed? And Beckham got to stay up. And I don't tell her, well, it's because you're going to get up two hours before him tomorrow. I don't even tell her that. I say, get in bed now. That's what I say. I say, what I do with your brother is none of your business. That's what I tell her. You worry about you. And, and I want to be much more polite to you, but, but what God is doing with somebody else ain't none of your business. You worry about you. You worry because listen, listen. What, when my daughter's upset, she said, "Well, what about Beckham?" She don't know. She don't know. She, she don't, I parent them different because they're different kids, different skills, different, different life. There's so many different things about them. And we look at somebody else, but but God, why do they get blessed? But but God, why why do they have that? But but God, why was this like that? But 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 God, what does it have to do with you? I ain't got nothing to do with you. Well, first of all, we have no idea what the actual truth is. We, we compare our worst moment to somebody else's highlight reel, and, and their highlight reel ain't actually real. And we don't know the baggage that came with whatever that is. We don't know the behind the scenes that came with whatever that is. We don't know anything. We've got to set a lower baseline. That's something else that my kids very well know. I, if you will ask them today, what do you deserve in life? They will tell you, Hell. That's how I parent them. What do you deserve? Hell. That's what they ask me for ice cream. I'm like, what do you deserve? Hell. Okay, then you can have broccoli. That's a step up. <laughs> but, but, and that's a little bit stupid, but. But what if that's legitimately the baseline, right? I don't deserve to be forgiven. I don't. I don't deserve to be blessed. I don't deserve to be free from my sin and guilt and shame. I don't deserve it. I deserve hell because I've actually offended God and his holy scripture. But because of the grace of God, I don't get what I deserve. I actually, because of the cross, because Jesus came and died, I get freedom, I get purpose, I get, I get eternity. But, but when our, 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 our mindset is, I know that I actually only deserve hell in life, but, but I get freedom and I get, I get purpose. And all of a sudden, everything else that happens in our, in our lives, we're so grateful for because we know I don't actually deserve any of this. So I'm no longer looking at, at what somebody else has. I'm grateful and content with what the Lord has blessed me with. Be grateful for what you have. Celebrate people. Be the greatest cheerleader of humanity. Joseph could have been jealous. I don't do anything wrong, yet I'm the slave. I didn't do anything wrong, yet I'm in prison. All right. How does he get to do? How do they? Why didn't he? Because even in the midst of difficult circumstances, he was confident of the call of God on his life. I used to struggle with jealousy quite a bit in some, some areas of my life. Maybe still at times it creeps in. I think all of us maybe it creeps in at times. My goal is to be the worst preacher that ever preaches on this platform. That's my goal. And I feel like I've done a pretty good job of that. 
But there are a little bit of, there's some times I get a little jealous. Sometimes I get jealous, man. I see people lead, and I'm like, man, I wish, I, I wish I could lead better. Back in the day, I used to get jealous of big churches. Now I get jealous of small churches. <laughs> I see people that have like two people on their staff, and I'm like, whoo, 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 that sounds so fun to me. You preach one time on a Sunday, fantastic, I'm in. I want, I want that, I'm jealous of that. It's so easy for me to combat the, anytime jealousy starts to creep in, because I fully believe this with everything in me. I'm exactly where God wants me to be. I fully believe, I'm, I'm, I'm living the life that God has called me to live. Now, I still make mistakes and I still screw stuff up, but I know that I'm, I'm living the life he's called me to live. And I know that he will equip me to do everything that he's called me to do. So therefore, if he's calling me to do it, he will equip me. If he's not calling me to do it, then he won't equip me, so I don't need to worry about it. Joseph's brothers were, they were jealous, they were offended, they were also negative. Negativity, that's one of those relationship killers. Joseph's brothers, they're working in a field. Joseph comes to meet him in Genesis 37, 19. It says, here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him. It's fairly negative. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. A little bit of sarcasm here in this passage. Oh, this dreamer think he's so good. He's never going to end up in this posi- position of authority like he thinks he is. And this thought process actually compels them to do the things that they have done. You know what I mean, people? It doesn't matter what happens in their life. They're negative about everything. It's just they're negative about everything. They could win the lottery. Remember, like, uh, I guess a few weeks ago, the lottery got up to a billion dollars. After taxes, that's still like $600 million or something ridiculous. Like, there are some people that the only thing that they would talk about is the taxes they have to pay. Well, I won the lottery, but I cannot believe I got to pay the four hundred million dollars in tax. You just won six hundred million, free and clear. No, I, but, but the taxes, the taxes, you know. I'm having these family coming out of the woodwork trying to get some of this cash. I was just, uh, you can't win, right? Some of you've been praying about a job for a decade. You finally get that job, and you're like, uh, it's kind of a far drive. You've been, you, you've been praying about having kids for a decade. You finally have a kid, and you're like, they poop too much. That's what they do. They'll grow out of it. They should grow out of it, at least. Here's the thing. Negativity breeds negativity. I just think about, we're, we're going to talk about marriage in a few weeks, but think about in your marriage. If you're always trying to look for the negative, you're never going to focus on the, on the positive. Like if, if, if Christy were to only focus on the fact that I, I rarely pick up my dirty socks, she would lose sight of my charming personality so quickly. You know? Of course, you, I'm not saying ignore the things you need to ignore. I'm not saying that. But just don't let negativity keep you from making an effort to make things better and celebrating the progress in yourself and in others. And listen, if every time a friend comes to you with a, a new dream or an idea, like so many of you, you think it's like a spiritual gift to be the voice of reason. Stop. You don't need to be the voice of reason. Be the voice of encouragement. You, you don't need a 10-point PowerPoint presentation to tell them why they're not going to be able to achieve their dream. Just love them. Be encourager. Listen, if you're always negative, they ain't going to come around you anymore. And if you're always negative, you're going to find yourself being around only negative people. Some of you, 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 you can't figure out why your family doesn't invite you over more than Thanksgiving and Christmas. And the reality is they only invite you over on Thanksgiving and Christ, Christmas because they feel obligated. And right now, you've got like 19 things saved up in the notes on your phone, political statements that you cannot wait for Thanksgiving. That's why. <laughs> Joseph avoided the negativity because he had faith in God regardless of his circumstances. I don't, I don't have to live, live a negative life. I don't have to focus on the negative 
Because my, my faith is often different than my current reality. And, and I, I, I can choose what, I, I can choose to be negative about my, my current reality. And a lot of you, I'm just being real with you. There are some of you that right now, a lot of you maybe, there is some difficulty and some negativity in the current reality that you cannot change. Just like Joseph could not change that he was in prison or he could not change that he was in slavery. But what he could change was his attitude in prison and in slavery. What he could do is focus on the goodness and the promises that God had. What kept him what kept him going when he was a slave? What kept him going when he was in prison? It was the promises of God that kept him going. Ne- the, the, the negative reality of some of your life is I'm broke right now, but the promise of God is that he is your provider. The negative reality is my marriage is falling apart, but the promise from God is he is your restorer. The negative reality is I got a bad report from the doctor. But the promise of God is by his stripes we are healed. Negative reality right now for for some of you is my life is absolute chaos, but we have a promise from God. That he gives a peace that passes understanding. I cannot decide my circumstances, but I can decide my attitude in the midst of the circumstances. Just as negativity breeds negativity, so does positive breeds positive. A few weeks ago, I talked about a study from a neuroscientist that said, you can rewire your brain. And this is how God created us. When you're negative, you're going to think negative. When you see, when you see negative, you're going to see more negative. Negativity is a multiplying factor in your brain, but so is positivity. So if you begin to focus on the positive, then it will re- replicate itself, and you'll begin to see more positive. And some of you, it's, it's tricky because you want to be positive, but it just seems like there's something negative or somebody negative always coming at you. I'm going to help you. Uh, and so I'm going to close this. I'm going to help you. It's a really quick tip. I use this all the time, not very much anymore, but I used to use this all the time because you guys don't really gripe about our staff anymore. But in the early days, people griped about our staff a lot more. And they would come to me and they would say, you're not going to believe what someone's out dead. And I would listen to them. And I would say, you know, I wasn't there, but man, you know about so-and-so's heart for the Lord? Man, you know, but they pray so much. They, I see them seek the God, seek God every single day. Man, they're such a good father, such a good mother. Man, I know that they love this church. I, man, I know that they love people. Man, I've seen nothing but but kind and encouragement from from this person. Now, behind the scenes, what I'll do is I'll go talk to that person and say, "Okay, what's going on? Tell me, tell me what happened." And then, if we need to have a tough conversation, we will. But in front of somebody else, I'm just speaking positive. You know what happens when somebody's trying to be negative and all you do is pull out the positive? It gets super awkward super quick. They got nothing to say. Just pull out the the fire hose on their fire that they're trying to create. You don't got to play that game. You don't even have to listen. Speak positive. Easy to diffuse a negative conversation. The story of Joseph ends with his reconciliation of his family because he doesn't allow offense or jealousy or negativity to grab hold of his heart. My prayer for us is not only that we don't allow it to grab our heart, that we protect our heart from being offended. We don't take that bait. We protect our heart from being jealous. We're we content with what the Lord has, has given us. Pre- protect our heart from negativity. But also is that we, we guard our words from from being offensive. Guard our hearts, our our tongues from being negative, from speaking those jealous words. Look, listen, we know, we say this all the time, we're better together, right? Everybody says, we're better together. And occasionally I hear people say this, well, I just, just me and Jesus, that's all I need. All I need, just me and Jesus. And I, I, I understand the statement, but that's actually not how God created you. The first thing that God said wasn't good was when he said it wasn't good for man to be alone. Throughout the entirety of scripture, it will say one another, love one another, confront one another, comfort one another, challenge one another, encourage one another. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Strand of three cords is not easily broken, right? Like 
You can say, I can do this on my own, just me and Jesus. That's not how you were designed. He designed us to do life together. So let's not just say we're going to do life together, but let's make sure we have healthy relationships with, with each other. So next we're going to talk about how to, how to have uh, healthy relationships. And we're going to talk about, uh, one we're going to talk about marriage for all the college students and uh, well, all the single people. We're going to talk about singleness and dating uh, in, in, in several weeks. So hopefully this series is going to help us uh, in all of our relationships. But let me pray over you this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you. We're grateful for you. We're grateful for who you are, what you've done. God, help us to to have biblically solid, healthy relationships. God, help us have relationships that honor you. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here in this auditorium and I know today we, we talk about relationships with each other, but the reality is the most important relationship that you will ever have is a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're here and just honestly, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you said a prayer at one point or maybe you raised your hand at one point, but, but you don't have a relationship with him. You don't actually follow him. Following Jesus is not about a prayer. Following Jesus is actually about following Jesus. So if you're here today and you say, I don't actually follow Jesus, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I want to. I want to be forgiven of my sins because I believe Jesus is exactly who he says he is. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up in the air so I can pray for you? Thanks, amen. Anybody else? Thanks, yeah. Thanks up top. Awesome. Thanks in the back, yeah. Amen, amen. You can put your hands down. Everybody cross this auditorium and pray this prayer together with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross and the resurrection. Forgive me my sins. I'm never going to live for myself. I'm always going to live for you. You are my Savior and my sacrifice. You're my Lord and my King. You are everything to me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for setting me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much for jumping on our YouTube page today. Uh, my name is Adam, this is my wife, Christy. We pastor here at Victory Family Church. We talk about family a lot, and we just wanna say uh, welcome to our family. Even if you're online, you are still a part of our family. We'd love for you to subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel and stay in touch with us, uh, hopefully. The content here will help challenge you, encourage you, grow in your relationship with the Lord, and maybe even make you laugh a little bit along the way. So love you, grateful for you. Thanks for joining us.